PowerPoint. All right, so today we're going to talk about chapter 39, which is digital imaging, dental film, and processing radiographs. With this chapter, you guys are going to feel like you know some stuff already because we've done it in the lab. So again, we're going to talk about some of the key terms and the purposes of uses of the digital, along with uh, the fundamental systems of it, the equipment, uh, we're going to identify the different types of uh, dental image receptors or sensors. We're going to talk a little bit about that. If uh, the office has phosphor plates, scanners, and the advantages and disadvantages of digital. And uh, we're also going to describe the changes to the image that a digital software uh, can make along with following uh, doing, uh, we're going to do the following regarding x-ray film and film processing. Okay, which you guys are perfecting as we continue in lab. So, to start off, we're going to learn the advantages and disadvantages and basic concepts of digital radiography, including scanning and digitizing dental images. We're going to learn the various types and uses of intraoral and extraoral films. Using conventional x-ray film, learn to use manual and automatic processing techniques and how to duplicate film, learn how to recognize common errors in film processing and how to prevent them from occurring. Now, digital has been used in dentistry, believe it or not, since 1987 and today in many areas of the United States and Canada, dentists and dental schools are changing from conventional film-based radiography to digital. The term digital image is used instead of radiograph, x-rays, or films. Digital images are not radiographs, but are electronic signals that are captured by sensors and displayed on a computer monitor almost instantaneously. These images can be emailed to insurance companies and other dentists. Hard copies can be printed on image quality paper. And here is an example of what it may look like if you do it on the computer. Our uh, software actually is going to look like this also once we start doing the digital. First, we're going to finish off with film and then we will add on digital. Now, digital is a convention. Uh, we still use our conventional x-ray machine. OK, so we still use the tube head with the extension arm and the control panel. The positioning of the image receptor or the sensor or phosphor plates in the mouth is identical to positioning the film. So the way I am teaching you how to position film would be the same way how you position the sensors. Strict infection control measures must be used because the sensors and the PSPs, which is the phosphor storage plates, are reused time and again. So unlike film where you guys destroy it and open up the packet, throw it away in the trash and let for your recycle, the sensors, we use that same sensor for every single patient. That's why infection control is critical. FDA clear disposable fluid pervious barriers must be used on digital image sensor and phosphor plates. Okay, so uh, of course the barriers are thrown away after every single patient. Now, there are types of digital imaging system. There's two basic methods, direct and indirect. With direct, it's a solid state sensor is the image receptor. It contains an X-ray sensitive silicone chip with an electronic circuit embedded in the silicone. The charge coupled device, CCD sensor, is the most commonly used digital receptor. receptor. Like telephones, some CCDs are wireless. Other types have a cable connected directly from the sensor to the computer. And that's the one we have. We have the one that it, uh, connects straight to the computer. Now, indirect is your phosphor storaging Im imaging. The image receptor is a thin, flexible plate the size of conventional X-ray film that has been coated with phosphor crystals. Uh, the phosphor layer is able to store the energy of the X-ray photons for some time. A scanner is required to read the information stored on the plate by using a laser beam to release the energy from the plate and convert it into a digital image. If you look at your um, 
uh, your Kindle book, you will see the uh, uh, the phosphor plates and the digital imaging sensor, the pictures of it. So please take a look because they are a little bit different. Again, the phosphor plates, you need a scanner and then the uh, sensors, you don't. It goes directly into the computer or wireless. OK, so after the plates are scanned, they're exposed to bright light that erases all remaining energy and the plates are ready to be used again. For infection control, the imaging plate is inserted into a specifically designed barrier envelope, and the barrier envelope is sealed by removing the adhesive strip and pressing the envelope closed. The imaging plate is positioned in the patient's mouth using the same positioning techniques as uh, the conventional film. After exposure, the plate is carefully removed from the barrier envelope and is then scanner that uses a laser to display the image on the computer. The imaging plates cannot be autoclave and extreme care must be taken when handling to avoid scratches or dust. What I like about the plates is that they're really thin, just like film. What I don't like about the plates is that, yes, they are easily, uh, if you uh, grab them wrong you and you have nails, even with gloves, you tend to scratch them. And if you expose them to light, you ruin them. So there are advantages and disadvantages. Now, film-based radiographs may be digitized for viewing on a computer in much the same way as any other document. Desktop scanners capture and digitize the light signal or whatever is placed inside them. The process is similar to placing a film on a duplicated light box. This type of indirect digital imaging is slightly less detailed than direct digital imaging because the resultant image is similar to a copy of the image. So in other words, you can take the film that you guys are taking, the x-rays that you guys are taking right now that you're mounting, and you can put them on a desktop scanner and put them in, in through the computer if uh, the doctor still has film, but he wants them on uh, digitized. He would do it that way. Now, the good news is most people have gotten rid of that uh, way, and a lot of people are uh, streaming to the digital. But you know, don't don't be fooled. A lot of doctors still are some are still using the film. Uh, most computer software programs that are used in digital imaging are capable of performing electronic image enhancement. The operator can change the following image variables either together or separately, like your contrast, brightness, image size, sharpness, inversion, and pseudo color alterations, such as this example here. So, for instance, this is the x ray, and they changed it with a little bit of color. Okay, so some pseudo color, and then they can change the contrast on, on it. So there is some image manipulation. So x-ray film and film processing. So while many dental practices are transitioning to digital, a significant number of are still using the conventional film base, which is what I told you guys. So you guys need to understand the procedure and techniques necessary to process films into a high quality diagnostic image. By the time this mod is over, you'll know both. Uh, how to take film and how to do digital. Film is the correct term to use before it has been processed. The film in the packet is in the packet. The film is placed in the bite block and the film is exposed and processed. After the film has been processed, it becomes an image or radio. So when I hand you the film, it's still a film. When you process it, now it's an x-ray or radiograph. Remember, they mean the same thing. Positioning instruments are used to position and hold the dental x-ray films or the digital sensor in the patient's mouth. So, as you all know, you've learned that already. Instruments uh, are your XCP rings. So, use of position is keep the patient's fingers from being exposed to x-radiation. Positioners also assist the operator in properly placing the film or sensor and the position uh, indicator device. Give me a second here. I'm having people trying to call me. I guess they can't get on. 
if you guys, as I'm lecturing, if you can help them or assist them, because uh, I usually don't stop lecture to uh, bring anybody on. Uh, everybody should be at this time. Um, so if you guys can help me with that, I really appreciate it. Uh, various types of intraoral positioning instruments are currently available. The sensor holders used in digital radiography are almost identical to the X-ray film holders used in conventional techniques. The primary difference is in the size and shape of the holder. So here is some different holders that when we come back to lab, we're going to be discussing. OK, these are called snap arrays or easy grip. <clears throat> so notice what these don't have. These don't have the ring. The other ones that we're using has the ring, but this one doesn't have uh, the ring. And there's double ended instruments for the bisecting technique. Hold the film or phosphor plate between two serrated plastic grips that can be locked into place. One basic film holder is a disposable uh, styrofoam bite block with a backing plate and a slot for film retention. And the endo ray devices used to take radiographs when instruments are in the canal. So we're also going to be actually using these little styrofoam things. Again, notice how we don't have the ring with it. And we're going to also use these tabs here. So that way you can um, you can um, learn how to take x-rays, how to try to position with the eye, okay, and make sure that um, they can get in. Um, there's some people saying they can't connect. If you guys can answer them and tell them to please... Um, Please log off and retry again. Endo ray. So I showed you this one and I really want you guys, when you're waiting for your turn to take x-rays, I really want you guys to start um, practicing all the XTPs, not just your bite wings, not just your posteriors and your anteriors. I also want you to practice the digital. I want you to practice the snap array. I want you to practice the endo ray. I want you to practice everything so when you get to go outside in the field, you are excellent at it, okay? So beam alignment devices, D these are devices used to align. The beam are available from several manufacturers to both film-based and digital techniques. The beam alight devices assist in the positioning of the PID in relation to the tooth and film or sensor. Uh, RIN XCP instruments use color-coded plastic bite blocks, plastic aiming rings, and metal indicator arms for film-based techniques. Your RIN XCP DS are for holding digital sensors. So again, I have both. I need you to practice both. And here's some different um, sensors uh, and holding devices. All right, so I actually have them. Please practice them. Any questions so far before I continue? No, ma'am. OK. All right, so we're going to continue discussing film, explaining uh, why it's important to know the film speed, the five basic sizes, the contents of it, which a lot of this stuff you guys already know. Uh, we're going to explain the purpose of intensifying screen, two types of extra oral films, the process of duplicating them and how dental film should be stored. So film is used in dental radiography. It's similar to photographic film with some adaptations. A photographic image is produced on dental x-ray film when it is exposed to x-rays that have passed through teeth and adjacent tissues. The dental assistant must understand the composition of X-ray film and latent image formation that results in increased patient exposure to X-rays. Intraoral film is made up of a clear semi-flexible cellulose acetate film base that is coated on both sides with an emulsion of silver bromide, silver halide, and silver iodide that is sensitive to radiation. So you're probably saying, why is this important to know the film composition? 
Well, this is when we discuss this a little bit later. This is what uh, the different size of the crystals is the different uh, speeds of the film. OK, so here's a uh, picture here of the what a film base and emotion is. Now, guess what? I let you guys open up a packet in the light so you could see the different um, things inside the packet, the different the pa the outer package. And we're going to go over that, too. But when you get to the film, the film has a protective coating and then comes emulsion and there's adhesive. And when we look through the film, it looks transparent. But when we put it in the processor, then we get the X-ray. Um, of course, if we've exposed, uh, exposed it to light, we don't get anything. This is what it looks like, okay, when you scan, uh, when they scanned an electro electron micrograph of unprocessed emulsion, what it looks like, you know. Uh, this is 5,000 5, times magnification of a Kodak dental film. And those... Uh, white appearing are the unexposed silver bromide grains on it. Now you have what's called a latent image, and that's when the radiation interacts with the silver halide crystals in the film emulsion. The image on the film is produced. The image, which is not visible before processing, is called the latent image. An example of another type of latent image is fingerprints. So this is why it's important that we have our gloves on when we're processing, because if you touch an item and you can leave your fingerprints, even though you can't see them on that item. So when that item is treated, your fingerprints become invisible. So the doctor will know if you're processing films with or without gloves, because we do tend to touch the film on occasion with our uh, fingertips. And when we do that, it transfers on to the image. And when it's processed, he will see our fingerprint. And uh, of course he will not be, or she, depending on the doctor, will not be happy. So we have to be careful about that. Now the film speed refers to the amount of radiation required to produce a radiograph of standard density, which density again, if you remember from our first lecture is darkness. Film speed is determined by the following factors, the size of the silver highlight crystals, the thickness of the emulsion, and the presence of special radio sensitive dyes. Film speed determines how much exposure time is required to produce the image on film. Fast film requires less radiation. The film responds more quickly because the silver highlight crystals in the emulsion are larger. The larger the crystals, the faster the film speed. This is the same principle as film speed on photographic film. S-speed film, the newest and fastest film on the market today, reduces radiation exposure to the patient by 20% to 60% compared with E-speed and D-speed film. I have different types of uh, film, so when we come back to class, uh, I'll show you the different boxes. And the and boxes come again, all different colors, all different sizes. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, there are three types of x-ray films that are used in dental, intraoral, extraoral, and duplicating. So intraoral is so named because it is placed inside the mouth. So remember, intraoral is mouth inside, okay, inside. And the intraoral film has emulsion on both sides of the film instead of just one because it requires less radiation to produce an image. The film is packaged is in what is referred to as the film packet, and it's going to protect it from light and moisture. Intraoral film packets are typically available in boxes of 25, 100, or 150 films. The film packet may contain one film or two. Boxes of film are labeled with the following information, type of film, film speed, number of films per individual packet, total number of films in the box, and the expiration date. And on one corner of the film packet is a small raised bump known as the identification dot. Remember I told you guys yesterday, the dot in the slot, okay? And also remember the first x-ray packet I had you guys open was a double film. And this was the same, just like when you opened it, okay? So you have the outer package, the inner paper, the dental film, the inner paper wrap, 
and the lead foil packing. And remember, we mentioned that the lead foil has to be recycled and it also protects the film from backscatter radiation. Now the black paper uh, film wrapper inside the film packet is a protective sheet that covers the film and shields it from the light. The thin lead foil sheet is positioned behind the film to shield the film from backscattered radiation that results in film fog. The outer packet wrapping is a soft vinyl or paper wrapper that seals the film packet, protective black paper and lead foil sheet. And again, it looks like that, okay? Now, if you happen, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later on in our lecture, but if you happen to put the film wrong on the XCP RIN tab, you see on this lead foil, there's this herringbone pattern here, or we call it the tire track pattern. If you take the X-ray backwards, and you go ahead and process it, when that film comes out, it's going to have this lines of the lead foil and that's gonna let the doctor know that you did not place the film in the patient's mouth correctly. So that's why I always say, when you're looking through the rin, you should always see the white of the film. You should never see the color of the film because if you see the color, then you put the uh, film backwards. Now, there are five basic sizes, child, zero, narrow, anterior, one, adult, two, bite wing, three, and occlusal, four. And this is what it looks like. And again, remember what I just said, the white side. So if you turn it around, there's usually a colored side on one side of the packet and a white side. The white side should be facing towards the tube head. You look through it through the target and make sure it's white. And uh, these are all the different sizes. So make sure you know the sizes because you're gonna need that, uh, need to know that for the test also along with the terminology. Extra oral film. So extra is outside, okay? Intra in, extra out. Think about exit. Exit means outside, extra oral, okay? So extra oral films are used to examine large areas of the head or jaws, examples, of common extra oral films include panoramic, and we say pano, P-A-N-O for short, and cephalometric films, ceph, C-P-H for short, okay? So when we're writing it in notes, that's the way we usually write it. A panoramic film shows a panoramic or a wide view of the upper and lower jaws on a single radiograph. Think about your cell phones. A lot of people take panoramic views. What are you trying to see? The wide view of what you're looking at. A cephalometric film shows the bony and soft tissue areas of the facial profile. So here is a panoramic x-ray film. When you come to lab, I will have some um, examples and we're going to go over it. But really quickly right now, just to show you, if you see my arrow, my arrow up here is pointing to sinuses. Okay, this is the nose. Here are the wisdom teeth. And as you can see, uh, some of them are not fully erupted. Okay. And, um, you know, sometimes we'll see wisdom teeth impacted. Thank you. And um, we can count how many teeth are in the patient's mouth. Okay, we always start from the upper right and we go across and then we drop down and we come back to the lower right. So the panoramic film can tell you a lot of things. The panoramic can tell you um, things like impacted teeth, missing teeth. Uh, it can tell you if you see any breaks in the jaw, um, your, the sinuses, as I mentioned. Now here's a view of the cephalometric. So the cephalometric, is used a lot for the relationship to view the relationship of the jaw to the skull. Guess who uses this a lot? Ortho. Okay. Ortho uses this a lot to see how the jaw is. They actually use this to trace on and uh, figure out their treatment plan. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in lecture also. So extra oral uses a film screen system. The film is used in combination with intent intensifying screen. Extra oral film is supplied in boxes of 50 or 100, and it's also used, uh, it's available in five by seven inch or eight by 10 inch sizes. It's uh, extra oral film is not supplied in film packets. 
the film is stacked like a deck of cards in the box. So you got to be careful because if you leave the box open and you expose it to light, the entire box is ruined. So if you have a box of 50 or a box of 100, you just basically ruin the whole box. And so you have to load the cassette in the dark room. So they come like this in big boxes like this. So your set would be in here and your panel would be in the long one. And then these are what we call cassettes. Now, the cassette is a plastic or metal case used in extra oral uh, radiography to hold the film and protect it from exposure to light. And the cassettes are also available in rigid or flexible styles. To tell the patient's left side from the right as on intraoral films, the front of the cassette must be marked with red letters, like L for left side and R for right side. And the front side of the cassette must always face the patient during exposure. So here's the flexible one, okay? So this one is the flexible one, and uh, coming back to this one here, this is the rigid one. So you can't bend the metal one, but you can bend the flexible one. Now, inside of those cassette things, uh, cassette cartridges, there's intensifying screens, and it intensifies or increases the effect of the radiation and thus decreases the amount of exposure time needed. The intensifying screen is coated with a material called phosphor that gives off light when struck by X radiation. The film inside the cassette is sandwiched between the intensifying screens and is affected by both the light produced by the phosphor and the X radiation. However, there is a slight loss of image detail as a result of the intensified X ray beam because the light produces a halo effect at the edge of the image field. And again, I will show you that when you guys come in because I do have examples. So again, there's that rigid type, so we can bend these. And then the film goes in there and the intensifying screen is in there already. Now, film types, there's green sensitive. This type of film is used with cassettes that have rare earth intensifying screen. And there's a blue sensitive that's used with cassettes that have calcium tungstate intensifying screens. Most of the time they use the blue screen. Uh, duplicating films, special duplicating film and duplicating machines are necessary. <coughs> Excuse me, are necessary to duplicate radiographs. Duplicating film is used only in a darkroom setting and is never exposed to X-rays. The duplicating uh, machine produces white light to expose the film. Duplication process is performed again in the darkroom under the safe light. The longer the duplicating film is exposed to light, the lighter it will become. Opposite of X-ray film, which becomes darker when uh, exposed to light. The good news, guys, is this. And by the way, here's what a film duplicator looks like. Uh, but the good news is a lot of people are, uh, since they're using digital, how we duplicate X-rays, we just print, print out uh, the X-rays and we just put them on uh, either photo paper or even regular copy paper. Either way, the paper comes out, and that's how I'm going to be showing you uh, x-rays uh, when you come back to lab. I'm going to actually, I have them printed out for you already on paper. Film storage. All dental films should be stored according to the manufacturer's instruction. Provide protection from light, heat, moisture, chemicals, and or scatter radiation. 50% to 70% Fahrenheit, 30% to 50% humidity. You're going to keep away from the treatment room or near radiograph unit. If box is expired, it may result in age fog on radiographs. So what we normally do is we keep them in a cabinet uh, opposite from where we take x-rays. Film processing. Processing is a series of steps that changes the latent image on the exposed film into a radiograph by producing a visible image on the film. Proper processing is just as important as exposure technique in producing diagnostic quality, uh, quality radiographs. Radiographs that are non-diagnostic because of poor processing techniques must be taken exposing the patient to unnecessary radiation. So I know a lot of you guys want to take your retakes, and believe me, we are going to be taking another FMX. But I want you to see what your number one look like and how much better you get as we continue taking x-rays. 
In many practices, intraoral films are processed in an automatic processor. However, it is still necessary to know how to process the film manually. Okay, so right now you guys are press processing automatic. The machine is doing it all for you. All you have to do is make sure that you put it inside the machine correctly. Now the five steps in processing is development, rinsing, fixation, washing, and drying. So developing is the first step in processing films. A chemical solution called the developer is used. The purpose of the developer is to chemically reduce the exposed silver halide crystals to black metallic silver. The developer also softens the film in motion during the processing. Then comes rinsing. Rinsing of the films is necessary to remove the developer from the film so that the development process stops. Usually agitating the film rack for 20 seconds is sufficient. This must be done under safe light conditions. So as you know, when you guys are putting your film inside the uh, automatic processor, you don't really see all that going on, but that's what's going on, okay? But you know where the tanks are in front of the machine. You see the names developer, fixer, wash one and wash two. So wash one is doing the rinsing and wash two, two will do the final washing. So fixing, the acidic fixing solution removes the unexposed silver highlight crystals from the film emulsion. The fixer also hardens the film emulsion during this process. For permanent fixation, the film is kept in the fixer for a minimum of 10 minutes. However, Films may be removed from the fixing solution after three minutes for viewing. Now, that's only if you're doing manually. You all know that we can't open the automatic processor while it's going through its stages because we'll ruin any of the films that are in there if we do it prior. Now, films that are not properly fixed will fade and turn brown in a short time, and leaving films in the fixer for a long time over a weekend can remove the image from the film. So again, that goes back to if we're doing it manually. Washing after fixation, a water bath is used to wash the film. The washing, washing step requires about 20 minutes to thoroughly remove all excess chemicals from the emulsion. Only 20 minutes for uh, manual. If it, uh, We couldn't wait 20 minutes for automatic. The, believe it or not, even though, you know, we stand there and we watch that automated uh, processor to finish. Usually from total time, from start to total time, once you press the start button, not while you're loading it, because it all depends on how load, how long the person is taking to load it. But usually from the start button to the end when it finishes, it's usually about five minutes, believe it or not. I know it looks like it takes longer it's just because of the people um, putting it in and then taking their time. So that's why it looks like a long time. Processing solutions. Film processing solutions are also available in the following forms, powder, ready to use liquid, and liquid concentration. I actually have both of the ready to use or the liquid. Um, for the machine that you guys are using right now, it's ready, uh, it's actually liquid concentrate, and then we have to add some water to it. And then I have another machine that uh, we have just ready to use. So again, here's your developer and fixer. By the way, notice something. The red uh, bottle here is always your developer and it will have the uh, t uh, caps of it to make sure that you identify them as developer. So red is developer and usually the fixer is either a blue cap or a black cap, okay, for fixer. So that way, you don't get the two mixed up. Does anybody have any questions before I continue? Yes, I no. do. I do. Um, so when it comes to the film processing, since it's, or uh, rather the, um, the, yeah, the film processing. So since it takes longer than it does with the digital imaging that we've been doing in class, uh -huh. how often do we actually find that in the dental office today? Well, that's the thing. So it all depends. I would say right now it's still like 50-50. I mean, it's okay. getting closer where uh, most offices are. Because you got to remember, everybody was on film. Everybody. 
Right. And the only people that uh, changed to digital was the ones that really can afford it because a sensor alone is about 10 grand. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the thing is, if it, you got to remember, too, that most offices, especially the big practicer, practices, had to buy more than one sensor. Okay. okay. So is everybody on digital? No. But guess what? The good news is you guys, no matter what, will be able to know both. So by the time this month finishes, you'll uh, be able to know how to process films and how to process uh, and how to take digital x-rays. So that's the good news. So either way, you'll be ready. Okay. Anybody right. else? No questions? And guys, just remember, um, you can stop me at any time too, okay? I keep on going until somebody has a question or I stop at, uh, once I get to the learning objectives again. So in this process here, we're going to talk about film, film processing, uh, about dark rooms, the components of a processor, uh, different, uh, the, we're going to describe common time and temperature errors. By the way, I believe that is a workbook question in your activity, if I remember somewhere, so that'll help you to answer these questions. Uh, chemical contamination errors during film processing, handling how to uh, handle film errors that it can, can occur during film processing and describe some common lighting errors, errors during film processing also. So we're going to go through all that. So the requirements for a dark room, of course, cleanliness at all times, okay? So, you know, Right now, of course, I don't make a big deal because um, we're just learning. This was just day two of you guys taking x-rays. Now, starting next week, we're going to get more intense on the cleanliness. And what I mean by that is infection control items like your gloves, your disinfection sprays, your paper towels. We're going to next week start pretending that Dexter is real. And we're going to start learning how to first contaminate uh, deep um, disinfect those uh, films before we actually process them. And then also we're going to learn how um, when we do process them in the automatic processor that you make sure you're disinfecting everything. Because remember right now you guys are putting films in those little cups. Some of you guys are forgetting to take the cups out and throw away the trash and separate the lead foil. And you also have to remember so if the film is going in there, the cups have to be clean and any of the buttons that you're touching inside the processor have to be clean. Any knobs outside of the processor have to be clean. So we have to get a little bit better about that. Container label with a biohazard label for contaminated film packets or barriers. So we have that. Recycle container, we have that too for the lead foil. Okay, and of course, um, I heard that some of those left foils were, be thrown, were being thrown away in the trash. We do not throw them away in the trash. We have to recycle them. The light tightness, we check that on the processor, uh, making sure that the lid is closed properly. And the processing tanks for the developer and fixer solution and the uh, circulating water bath is all nice and clean. Now, the good thing about the automatic film processor that we're using, it tells us when we need to change everything. So that's the good thing. If we had a machine that we didn't know, then we would have to uh, write the date, uh, date on a paper and make sure that we all know when the fixer and developer was changed, when uh, the water would have to be changed on a daily basis because we would never know when uh, these things are changed if we had a machine that didn't tell us. Now, um, Running water with mixing valves to adjust the temperature. So we do have some machines that are automatically connected to the water. If you do have a dark room uh, for manual processing, we have to make sure that we have a safe light and a source of white normal light. Accurate timer. By the way, I am going to take you to a dark room in our other uh, classroom so you guys can see what a dark room looks like. Accurate floating thermometer, stirring rods or paddles to mix the chemicals and equalize the temperatures of the solutions. Safe storage space for chemicals, film, film hangers, film drying rack, and film dryer. So the good news is that 
Um, you know, back in my days, we had to manually process all the films. If you guys ever, or if you know somebody that does photography, or if you ever seen somebody do photography, they usually are in a dark room and they have pans and they put the film in the developer and fixer and then in the wash and then they hang up their picture. Well, back in the days, we used to do x-rays like that. We used to hang them and do all the steps just like uh, uh, if you were going to do a photo in a dark room. Good news, you know, that has really been done away with. Uh, you might still see it in an office because they had that uh, closet, as we used to call it, or dark room already situated, and they still have it, but now it's used probably for storage. So the dark room, the term light tight is often used to describe the dark room. To be light tight, no light leaks can be present. When you are in the dark room with the light turned off, no white light should be vi visible. X-ray film is extremely sensitive to visible white light and any leakage of white light can cause film fog. A fog film appears dull, gray, lacks contrast and is non-diagnostic. So again, we cannot let light go in either to the dark room or the automated, um, automated processor. You guys, you know, I tell you this, if you take your hands out, make sure the lid is closed because once you take out your hands, a little light goes through where your hands go in and you can ruin the films that are being wait, waiting to be processed. Now, the types of dark room lighting, there's room lighting, <clears throat> which is an overhead white light, protects adequate lighting for tasks such as cleaning, restocking of materials and mixing of chemicals. We have our safe lighting which is a low intensity light in the red orange spectrum. It provides enough illumination in the dark room to process film safely without exposure of or damage to the film. There's types, uh, there a continuation of types. There must be a safe distance between the light and the working area and the person developing the film must work quickly to keep the exposure to the safe light as short as possible. And it's not only quickly for that reason, but quickly because how many people, and you, as you guys can see here, you know, I, I let you try to figure it out because even in the office, if you are processing films, you have to work quickly because maybe several of you in the office are taking films and the doctor may be waiting on uh, somebody. And so you have to move a little bit quicker so that way everybody gets it done. So uh, continue with practice, you become more efficient and you become a little bit more quicker. Now, unwrapped films that are left exposed to the safe light or exposed to the safe light for more than two to three minutes appear fogged and a safe light must be placed on a minimum of four feet away from the film and the working area. And again, when we go to the dark room, I'll show you what a safe light looks like, okay? and the processing tanks. Now that I don't have, so you're just gonna have to look in your Kindle, all right? So the manual processing is a method that friends fix and wash them. The essential piece of equipment required for manual processing is a processing tank. The tank is divided into compartments to hold the developer solution, water bath and fixer, and it has two insert tanks and one master tank. So it'll look something like this, okay? So one is for fixing, one is for developing, and usually the middle is for water. So basically you would dip the film in developer, dip it in water, dip it in fixer, and back to water. And then uh, usually this is connected to a water valve on the wall, okay? So, but I have to tell you, a lot of people did get rid of the processing tank, okay? They might have kept the automated processor, but they got rid of the dip tank, as we call it, or the processing tank, okay? All right, moving on to automatic processor. is a fast and simple method used to process dental x-ray films. Other than opening the film packet, all steps of film processing are handled by the automatic processor. So I mentioned that to you guys. Usually the uh, error comes in the operator. You didn't put it right in the rack, uh, you exposed it to light, you forgot to turn on the, the start, you forgot to close the lid, things like that. The good news is that uh, with the automatic processor too, if uh, 
you press start and you didn't put down the lid, it beeps at you and it lets you know if it's beeping at you, it's letting you know something is wrong. And that's where you have to say to yourself, okay, did I forget something? And it's usually the lid. So if, if when you take out your film, if you find like I've had already this week, uh, some of you guys show me some films were stuck together. That means that you put two in one slot or you didn't push it down all the way into it slot um, unexposed films okay was another one um dropping the films that was another one so all those are operator errors so we just have to get better at it now automatic film processing requires only four to six minutes for developing fixing washing and drying and i told you that all right i said about five minutes less equipment and space required than manual processing and less error because time and temperature are automatic or are automatically controlled because with the dip tank you would have to take temperature with the automated processor it's ready the only thing that you guys have to get better at too you know we're going to take film so the first person usually that comes in should be the first person to at least press start so that way the machine can start warming up because that's one thing about all machines. All machines need to be warmed up, whether it's the autoclave, the ultrasonic, the automatic processor. That's why when you guys first come in into the office and again, think of the lab as your office. You're coming to work, you know, you're coming to start everything. You're going to start the ultrasonic, the autoclave, and you should go in a pattern. In this case, I will walk up to the automatic processor first start go um uh, to the autoclave see if anything has to be autoclave press start on that if it does if not and there's stuff in there to be put away then you put it away and then you go to the ultrasonic and you start that too and you and you go on from there if there is a cold um i told you that sometimes some people put the xcps in cold sterile if it was the nighttime and they left it overnight, then the first thing you want to do is take them out in the morning and rinse them out because you know that sometime today you're going to be taking x-rays. So again, better habits as you come into the lab, make sure that you treat it like you come into work. Now the automatic processor maintains the correct temperature, the solution, and adjusts the processing time. Proper maintenance of the automatic processor reduces the chance of errors during film processing. And many dental offices that have automatic processors still maintain manual processing equipment as a standby if the automatic processor malfunctions. What I've noticed is that uh, the people that have gone to digital, they've kept their automatic processor in storage just in case uh, the digital goes down, something happens to the sensor, uh, the laptop crashes or whatever the case may be they usually have some type of backup now for bigger office of course we have a baby automatic film processor but for bigger offices they will have this a2000 uh, that's like the most common one and again this will be in a dark room and you would slip the x-rays where my arrow is right in through these slots over here okay it's usually about four at a time. Each slot has a um, like a line to show you, you know, one film at a time. And then as soon as those films go in, you can load the next four and the next four and so on and so forth. If you're doing an FMX um, and then they'll come out through up here. Once they are processed, they'll come over. And then this is sort of more or less like what we have. OK. Um, where you slip your hands in on the top, you you do everything, you know, put the film in from the top, but then you slip your hands and you look up here and then everything falls on the bottom over here. So there are different daylight loaders. We have the daylight loader automatic processor. This one is just an automatic processor that goes in the darkroom. So again, depending on what the office has, it doesn't matter. You'll still be ready for it. Because you, you already know how to open up a film, and pretty soon you'll uh, know how to do digital. Now, the components. The processor housing covers all components parts. The film feed slot is for unwrapped films to be inserted. So basically what I just told you with the arrow. There's a roller film transporter. It's a system of rollers that rapidly moves the film through the compartments, and those compartments are your developer and your fixer. And then the film is transported directly from the developer 
and to the fixer. And then um, in, in that case, in that automatic processor, it goes developer, fixer, and then rinse. It, there's no separate uh, water between the developer and fixer. Now the water compartment holds circulating water and the drying chamber holds heated air and dries the wet film. So all that is in your automatic processor also. And then the processing solutions, levels of solutions in automatic processor must be checked and replenished daily and failure to do so leads to poor quality radiographs. Solutions should be replaced completely every two to six weeks. So again, as I mentioned before, um, if you don't have a film processor that tells you when it's time to change like ours, then you need some type of system to know when was the uh, fixer and developer put in when, and the water should be changed on a daily basis. So there's no question about that. So somewhere along the line in the dark room, there will be a list and it'll say fixer and developer changed on whatever date, October 28th and um, water is changed daily. Processing errors may occur for a variety of reasons, including the following time and temperature errors. So you're going to look in your um, Kindle for the table 39.4, 39.5, 6, and 7 for the processing errors, okay? Chemical contamination er errors, film handling errors, and lighting errors. Now, the dental assistant must be able to recognize the appearance of common processing errors and know what to do to prevent such problems from occurring again. I actually, when I give you the samples that I told you, we're going to go more into it in lab because it's so much better for me to point it out to you uh, while we're together. So we will also be doing it in lab, even though I'm going to go over some of them with you here. Now, common processing errors. The photograph on the following slides illustrate common examples of technical errors that can occur during film processing, such as in radiographs that are not diagnostic, thus requiring retakes and additional exposure to the patient. First of all, who can tell me what type of x-ray this is? Come on now. What kind of x-ray is this? A bite wing. Yep, a bite wing. Because here we see um, the coronal portions of the top maxillary and the bottom mandibular, and the teeth are ready to bite. What I will say, there's a lot of black air space here, okay? So that means that the uh, you didn't have the patient bite down all the way. They should be biting to the point where the coronal portions are almost touching each other. Now in this uh, film, this is uh, what's called an overdeveloped film. So overdevelopment results from a developer solution that is too concentrated or too warm, or that the film is left in the developer solution for too long. So those are the re three reasons why you might have overdevelopment. Okay, so the solution is too concentrated or too warm, or the film is left in the developer solution too long. So good job. That is a bite wing film. And we got to really know what we're looking at, okay? So here we go. We have two other films. Um, by the way, coming back to this bite wing, okay, you do see some premolars and you do see some molars. I mean, I don't know. Were they trying to take just molars or just premolars? So again, it's really important to make sure that you follow the guides and you're on where you need to be. If you're going to take molars, then we need these three molar shots. So we need to go a little further back in the mouth. And if we're taking premolars, then we need a, to come a little bit more forward. So that's an error right there in the x-ray too. Now, what do we have here? Who can tell me what type of x-rays are these called? And where are they if you know uh, where is it in the mouth? Is... B and antip, uh, anterior on the mandible. Excellent. Anterior on the mandible. Yes. And what about C? Who can tell me? C is posterior on the mandible. Excellent. Good job, guys. Good job. Both of you are correct. Okay. So. 
<clears throat> we have anterior. Now notice here too. Remember we talked yesterday about anterior or vertical. So this is a vertical x-ray and posterior or horizontal. So those are two other ways to distinguish if it's anterior or posterior. So perfect example here. We have one for the front and one for the back. How we know this is the lower because the lower teeth face this way, okay? So if, and we're going to see an upper in a minute, but you know, this is definitely a lower in the uh, anterior letter B, okay? You have your centrals and a lateral and a little bit of a canine. Over here, you have a cutoff molar, so your three molars and a little bit of a premolar, okay? And when you're looking at it, to eventually be able to recognize, is it left or right of the mouth? OK, so we're going to get more into that. But this X-ray is showing a uh, developer splash. Scratch the film. So on B, um, if we were doing manual, developer splashed on the film. So we have to be careful with that. So it ruined the film right here where my arrow is. And then down here, there's a scratch on the film. So that tells me that uh, that person either A, didn't use gloves or uh, roughly handled the film, okay? Here is another. So what do we have on these x-rays? Who can tell me? What kind of film is it? D is bite wing. Good, D is bite wing and what is E? Who knows what's E? E is uh, mandibular an uh, anterior. Excellent, excellent guys. You are doing so awesome. I'm so proud of you guys. So yes, D is a bite wing film. Again, notice the difference from the first bite wing to this bite wing that I showed you. This is a much better bite wing as far as it being closed, okay? We don't have that black, big black airspace in the middle. The only problem with this bite wing, we have a lot of overlapping, and we're going to talk about that too um, a little bit in lecture. Now, the other problem here is letter E. This is anterior, but guess what? They cut off the coronal portions. So listen, if Doc needs to see the coronal portion, he's going to be highly pissed off because you gave him an x-ray with just roots. How is he supposed to even know what's going on in the coronal portion if you cut it off? So things like this would need to be uh, retaken for sure, the overlapping in the coronal portion. But other things that are happening on these films, letter D has water spots. So again, water got on this now. And letter E shows that solution was too low. So that means that the whole entire, not only was the x-ray cut off, but on the bottom where the letter E is, there's a white portion of the film here too. So that means that the solution levels did not reach the entire film. Okay. So again, and that would be in a manual. Okay. Um, here is two more x-rays. Who can tell me what type of x-rays are these? F is a mandibular posterior. Good. Who can tell me what G is? I know it's very hard to see. G is a posterior mandibular. Oh, good job on the posterior. Now I want you to see something here. You see this area where my arrow is? The uh, the sinus cavity. Right, so somebody has this backwards, but good job. Yeah. Uh, so here, there's two problems here on these films, okay? So this is definitely, and it would have actually been a really, really good x-ray of the uh, premolars and the molar, okay? Um, but it has roller marks. So um, when they cleaned the processor, they didn't uh, put the rollers in correctly in the slots, so the rollers probably got stuck with the film and developed that roller mark. And then in letter G, perfect example of fingerprints. So of course the fingerprints are on there. This is a this X-ray is not diagnostic because it ruined the molars or the premolars or whatever I'm trying to see. 
I can't even see it because it's covered. Okay, so even over here where my arrow is, it looks like there's some water spots on it too. So there was a lot of errors with this x-ray here. Now, on this right here, okay, who can tell me what these are? Ma uh, I is maxillary uh, posterior. And H is maxillary posterior. Yeah, excellent. So both of them actually are maxillary because maxillary teeth have sinuses. So these little clouds over here. Now this one you barely can see it, but it is there. Okay. So these happen to be maxillary teeth. Do you want to know something else? How can you easily, if you were still unsure, how to identify maxillary from mandibular? Usually the maxillary molar roots are together. So if you notice, they almost look fused together, okay? Whereas, I'm going to go back to this x-ray, lower mandibular uh, roots are usually separated. So it looks like an upside down V over here. So you normally would be able to identify uppers and lowers by the roots. So lowers, if you were unsure, their roots are divided, whereas the roots on the top are together. And again, if you use the sinuses, the sinuses will be, some of them are really pronounced and you can really tell the sinuses. By the way, these white things on the teeth, are amalgam fillings, silver fillings. Silver fillings show up white like that, so silver fillings. Now, two things that we have uh, problems here, and I have mentioned one of them to you before, overlap, overlap film, okay? Usually overlap is uh, the operator error. When you put it in the patient's mouth, you didn't put it uh, straight on the tooth. You had the XEP a little bit slanted or uh, possibly the PID was not meeting the target, which is the XEP RIN. So you end up getting what's called overlapping. And then this x-ray, it was a little bit hard to tell what kind of, uh, a little bit, what it was, be, uh, especially with the sinuses because it's underdeveloped, okay? Underdeveloped. So again, um, underdeveloped, it could be inadequate development time, the developer solution is being, uh, it was too cool, or uh, the solution was depleted, there wasn't enough, or uh, the developer could even be contaminated, like it's time to change it. So a lot of reasons for undeveloped films, okay? Now, look at these films, yeesh! So I will tell you that both of these films are bite wings, okay? And we have what's called reticulation and fixed spots. Now, reticulation is a, a, a very rare error, but it is caused by a sudden temperature change between solutions. The best way for me to tell you reticulation is like your ice cubes. You ever put ice cubes in hot coffee or something hot and you hear it crackling? Well, the same thing can happen, uh, say for instance, you um, had to take your developer and fixer and add water to it uh, because it was one of the concentrate ones and you use one too hot and the other one too cold. And so when the film processing was going through it, it did this, okay? So it totally ruined the, uh, the film. That would definitely need to be retaken. And then the other one is fixer spots. So um, basically, you know, uh, there was some fixer uh, spots in your uh, dark room somewhere and it came in contact with your film. Uh, maybe when you were putting the fixer inside the tanks, it splattered somewhere and you put your film down there and all of a sudden it touched your film. So now it got these fixers. So, you know, definitely um, I know there was some assistance that I was looking at the machine and I said, oh, Look at there's some water over here and I wiped up the water because I even said water and electricity don't uh, mix. You know, these are things that we have to be like always paying attention. You know, I know the water tanks were, were being filled, but when we finish with the water tanks, we also have to check the area and make sure that no water splattered anywhere. 
and we have to make sure that the area is still nice and dry. So these are things that you guys have to remember. If we fill up tanks, if we change waters, anything that we pour, we have to then double check and make sure that nothing spilled out, that everything is nice and dry because we don't want it to touch the film. And we also don't want to touch us. Because some of those, uh, especially the fixer, there's like acidity to it. So it might make you feel like um, your skin itchy or a little bit burning sensation. Again, we should be using gloves. But still, if you spilled it on the counter or something, we want to make sure that it's nice and clean. Now, our next one. Who can tell me what x-ray is that? M is... Uh, and uh -huh. uh, is that similar? Uh, what is it? I'm sorry. L? I didn't hear L. What's L? Is it maxillary uh, anterior? Correct. So L is maxillary anterior. Okay. Again, remember easy to identify vertical versus horizontal automatically you see a vertical is usually uh, anterior and horizontal is usually posterior so l is definitely an anterior on the maxillary i see a central and a lateral or a la yeah i it's very hard why because this x-ray has been cut off okay the straight white border represents an undeveloped part of the film, which resulted from an insufficient level of developer. So there was only developer halfway in the tank. So only half of the x-ray got uh, um, exposed to it. And then over here, we have a bite wing. Now this bite wing would have been a really, really good bite wing because it has the premolars, which is probably what they were trying to take the premolar shot. So we got the premolars excellent, all the mesials and the distals, not, none of it was cut off. But the problem was that there's an error on this uh, x-ray. There's a lot of errors. There's, um, it looks like it's uh, overdeveloped. It looks like there's a fingerprint. It looks, let's see if you see my errors lightly there, but it looks like it's there. There's also another error over here. You know, there's so many errors that it's hard to tell. Like there looks like there's some spots on it. There's all kinds of errors on this x-ray. All I know is it would have been a really good x-ray if everything else didn't happen to it. All right, let's look at another one. What do we got here? What kind of x-rays are these? N is maxillary posterior. Correct. And O is mandibular posterior. Good, excellent. So we have a maxillary and here are the sinuses, okay? And this is a lower and here's how, you know, these, yeah, the roots look almost closely together, but this one is separated. It's hard to tell because we have fixer cutoffs and air bubbles on this film and it's, it's uh, actually um how do you call hindering us from really seeing the but here this black right here okay so this part of the film there uh, just like the developer you know there wasn't enough developer in the film prior in this one there wasn't enough fixer okay so it cut it off and then this one has some air bubbles so what this means is that Whoever turned on the um, processor did not let the machine run its uh, warm-up time and they automatically uh, started processing films. And so all the stuff wasn't mixed correctly, so we got air bubbles. So again, this is why it's super important. You come in, turn on the processor, turn on everything to start off everything. So that way, when it's time, we're ready to groove, okay, and get on moving. So here... We have two films here, okay? They are both, again, posterior films, okay? The letter P is for the mandibular, letter Q is for the maxillary. So on letter P, we have more fingerprints and we have some water spots. And I want to point this one specifically to you guys because I, I've been seeing it in lab. 
and I was hoping that it would happen on your guys' film, but eventually it will. Static electricity, okay? Now, can anybody even guess why you think static electricity might occur? Because of the heat and water? Possibly, yeah, that's a good one. Yep, but something even more. Something that most people carry on them. What do you think it is? Is it the cell phone? Yes, you hit it on the nose, the cell phones. You know, I don't know if you've gone to places that uh, have uh, take x-rays, whether it's in the hospital or even in dental offices, and it says, beyond this door, turn off your cell phone. Well, it's not only uh, not to be rude when the doctor is talking to you, of course, you know, but it's because sometimes when we're taking x-rays, if your phone happens to ring or vibrates or something like that, and you're taking a, an x-ray film, it sends off static electricity. And a lot of times uh, this will happen on your film. So, you know, it is important to let the patient know, and not only the patient, but you also, you know, turn off your phone or keep it away from you when you're taking x-rays, especially digital. Digital is even more sensitive to film, okay? So um, you will see these errors. And I know quite a few doctors that get really pissed off when they see this because they know either A, it was the patient, or B, their assistant. So be real careful about that, okay? Also, static electricity, I don't know, you know, I, I come from the old school, rug. You know, I, I ever played that trick? You rub your feet on the rug, touch somebody, and boom, give them a shot. Okay, so sometimes off some offices still have rugs. You may develop static electricity if you rub your feet on the rug and then go ahead and take an x-ray, and you might have that up here. But guess what? Most offices have gotten rid of the rug because of this also. And not only that, because it trapped a lot of uh, contaminated stuff rugs and now pretty much everybody has either linoleum or tiles on their floor. All right, one more and we're almost finished and hang in there everybody, you're doing great. What do we got here? Who can tell me what these x-rays are? R is mandibular posterior. Good. S is um, bite one. Excellent, excellent guys. You know, I'm really proud of all of you, you know, keep it up and we're going to continue, you know. So of course, R is exposed to light. So when it got exposed to light, it made this dark here, this dark uh, where the letter R is, okay? So it kind of ruined this molar here. God forbid if this patient had a abscess right there, we would not be able to see it, so we would have to retake this x-ray. And then again, see how the roots are divided? So that kind of lets you know that it is a mandibular, not to mention that the x-ray is horizontal, so definitely it is in the posterior. And then, of course, you have your bite wings here. And here's your premolars. So this was probably more a premolar shot than a molar shot because I do see some of the uh, molar over here. And, of course, this area right here looks a little bit foggy. And foggy can happen for many reasons, like improper safe lighting, light leaks, outdated or expired films, improper film storage, contaminated solutions, or sometimes solutions are too hot. So those were the reasons why, okay? Um, <clears throat> coming back to the exposure of light, the exposure of light could have been um, you open up the film packet before the door was closed in the dark room, or uh, you expose light in the automatic processor, or you forgot to close the lid on the automatic processor or things like that, but you definitely let light come into it uh, prior to you developing it. And again, this little white thing here is an amalgam filling. And we're going to go more into also surfaces. Where is these fillings? Where are these restorations for charting? Because we need to know our charting also. When you look at films, the good thing, guys, is this. You have been identifying films of, is it posterior? Is it anterior? Is it bite wings? Remember, um, 
Usually in the anterior and posterior, those are called periapicals. Periapicals, we can see from the crown of the tooth to the root of the tooth, periapicals. And bite wings, we will see both the maxillary and the mandibular on one single film of them biting down. So these are things that you guys got to continue uh, identifying so when you are mounting, you know where they go. So round one was a little bit tough because it was round one. You know, we're just learning. We're going to finish on Monday uh, when we come to lab, our posterior, and we're going to start a new set of film. And in that new set of film, you're going to be taking more x-rays. It won't be broken down into so many uh, as we did. We're going to move a little bit quicker. So then that up and then you're going to mount and then I'll look at the film. Here I've been looking at the film as we do bite wings, as we do anteriors, as we do posteriors, but next week is going to be more on you and I want you to uh, really, really sit with the view box and really uh, place them together and we're going to continue practicing. Good job everybody. Anybody has any questions? Any more questions? No ma'am. All right, let me take quick attendance here. Give me a second. It's not pulling it up. Give me a second here. One second. Yeah, don't leave. All right, class, give me one second. It's not pulling up my attendance. Just give me a second here.